Michelle Battersby, welcome to The Mentor. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. All the way from LA. Yep, all the way from sunny Santa Monica, LA. Oh, well, one of the good places, Santa Monica. And uh, Santa Monica, that's near the beach, though. That's, uh, there is a beach in Santa Monica, but is, are you anywhere near the beach? I am. I can see it in the distance. I think most Australians tend to move to Venice, Santa Monica. The beaches definitely don't compare, but the lifestyle is somewhat similar to Australia. You don't swim there, do you? They, they tell me that you can't swim there at the moment. I've lived here a year and I have not been in the ocean once. Yeah, yeah, that's what they tell me. <laughs> no, not many people actually swim. Uh, they do plenty of gym work. So you're relatively speaking a young woman and you know, wow. you're doing your thing in the United States. But I want to take you back a little bit. Um, we're born in Australia, but where'd you grow up? I grew up in Bagala Heights on the northern beaches near Manly. So had a pretty normal upbringing, I think. Did nippers like most kids who, uh, got, who grew at up Manly. in that. Yeah, at Manly. Went to high school in Sydney and ended up going to the University of Sydney. I feel like it's what most people do who come from that part of town. The nipper things are pretty um, sort of like standard to some extent for Manly <laughs> residents or people who live around the area. You know, you start in the under six, you do the little beach work and uh, – a little bit of you know, a few runs on the beach, and then you eventually go into the swim, and uh, and you and maybe you go into competitions if you really love it. Um, but it's that's very Australian. That's like very Sydney yeah. too, by the way. Yeah, very and Sydney. I, 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 totally. Uh, what did you do at university, Sydney University? So when I finished high school, I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I had always loved sport, though. So sport was the thing that kept me going through school, through high school in particular. And then sport ended up being the thing that helped me get into Sydney Uni. So I was never that academic, but I got extra points um, on my for my UAI um, for rowing and then rowed at Sydney Uni. And that was kind of why I, I wanted to go to uni because I could keep rowing. Okay, so you're a rower. Um, hard was. sport, tough sport. It was a rower. <laughs> hard sport, <laughs> yeah. tough sport. But it's one of those sports when you're at school, you've got to get up at 6 a.m., you've got to get down to wherever they do the rowing training quite a disciplined environment. You know, you may not have done so well at school, but the reason why universities like Sydney reward or give you extra points is because they're rewarding the discipline and uh, the outcomes that you've achieved. So what did you study at Sydney? So I did a Bachelor of Arts and then I did a Master's in Industrial Relations and Human Resource Management. So I picked a, I picked a broad degree because I wasn't really drawn to anything in, in particular. So I thought I may as well just do arts and see if I, you know, find I'm passionate about something at the end of that degree. And I, I to be honest, still wasn't really passionate about much, but my dad told me that I was good with people and that I should think about going into HR. So I did a master's in HR, really liked it, and then got an internship at Citibank and started working in HR as an HR generalist. That, that's pretty interesting because, you know, considering where you are today, maybe what you stand for today, one of the things you stand for today, but to me, HR is a big Big deal today, particularly after or well, during COVID. Um, I discovered that as a business owner, human resources and the relationship between human resources or the people in the business and the business were particularly sort of turbocharged during the COVID period and will continue to do so because it's here forever. And my HR team became extraordinarily important. And one of the things I got from it is that um, HR sort of provides a, a platform for fairness Mm. Um, and today we talk about inclusivity, a whole lot of other things. Fairness includes all those things because fairness by, its, by itself is uh, an inclusive concept. But it starts off as fairness, what's fair in the organisation and our HR department seems to provide the platform between the proprietor and the shareholder's interest, which is profit and uh, revenues and value growth, and the staff, which is may have a slightly different view, but definitely they have a view in relation to where they sit in the, their work. They're there to, you know, make money. They're there to be fairly treated. They're there to be uh, educated and learn. And they have they all have different interests. And the HR department sort of sits in between them. And often I find myself uh, that the uh, negotiating with the HR department to some extent, um, and uh, it's an interesting concept. And your dad must have seen the potential growth in this environment. So you decided that that was something that suited you and you worked, did you say Citibank as an intern? Yeah, I got an internship at Citibank. And then I also spent some time at UBS and ended up going back to City uh, for a larger role as well. So I spent about four years 
doing that. Right. So what did you get out of being involved? A, having a master's degree and done the you know theoretical study around HR as a component of any business and then working. What did you get out of those years, those years of study and those years of working? I realize now how important those years actually were and how many transferable skills you can really get out of HR. It almost set me up with a good understanding of how to run a business to your point, like fairly and equitably. And what happens um, when you don't treat people well or deal with, you know, personnel issues in in the right kind of way. Um, So I've definitely taken a lot of the people side into what I do now. But I think just working in those huge global businesses um, that have, they're they're so heavily regulated, there's so much red tape. Um, I learned a lot about process, but I also learned that I didn't really like process and I didn't like red tape. Um, And I think that's what ultimately led me to the startup world. I mean, in those big organisations, you're right, they're over-regulated for a whole lot of good reasons, particularly places like UBS and Citibank, yeah. they're banks. Um, <laughs> uh, but there are they do have reputations or individuals within those organisations have reputations of they'll do anything to get to the top. And uh, no, we're just going through here, I don't know if you've been keeping up with it here in Australia, but we've got an election coming up. We've got a whole lot of uh, drama around political parties and how they treat women in both parties, probably all parties, but at least both the two major parties. And there's a, unfortunately, there's a, a recent death by heart attack, it seems, of one woman in one of the parties. Uh, it's sort of like suggesting bullying or intimidation, et cetera. It's sort of suggesting that the political parties haven't caught up with that equitable treatment and the fair treatment you just mentioned. That skill that you saw in those big organisations, has that at all influenced who you've become and what you've decided to do ultimately? I think one of the things that I learned most and probably more a behaviour working in banking instilled in me was I think I was 21 or 22 when I first started managing my own department. So I used to go in and tell like the head of the research floor at Citibank like how they should handle, you know, their staff, you know, compensation and benefits, um, investigations. I would investigate people for bullying, some of the darker side of what happens in a business. And I had to become very good at like standing my ground, having courage in my conviction, even though I was so much younger and so much more inexperienced than a lot of the people around me, but they kind of trusted what I was saying. So I think like in more of like the who I am today type realm it's probably really helped me when I'm now you know going into pitches um speaking to huge VC funds having to have confidence um even though I'm often doing things for the very first time um and then I think when it comes down to how you treat people um I also had exposure to yeah what happens if you don't handle things quickly Um, and in a fair way and if you don't you know involve the right people at the right time it's all the skills I feel like everyone is aware of like keeping paper trails ensuring that you have policies and um, processes in place when it comes to how staff can can behave in the workplace what they gain access to what they lose access to when they leave Um, there's probably a lot of things that I could have done wrong um, at both Bumble and now at at Sunroom if I hadn't have seen those kinds of things. And I think it was really good having that, having exposure to that from such a young age because I could really soak it up. I, my mind wasn't tainted. I wasn't like bitter about anything. I could really just observe and learn as much as possible. Talk about Bumble in a second, but my gut feeling is in order to be offered roles in those environments, like Bumble, for example, which is sort of seems to be your next foray, you need to be able to survive, suffer and survive the pitch process. We are all always pitching and you have to do it with confidence. You have to exude confidence and you've got to get that from somewhere at a young age, female, uh, working in banking environment, which is largely males, particularly those places you just mentioned. I, you know, I know those places are pretty tough environments. Do you think that your confidence and your ability to pull it off, so to speak, is based on your ability to get a thorough understanding of how the joint rolls, how it works, what the rhythm is. I mean, what is it that gives you confidence? Yeah, I think I could tell that I, this is such a strange thing to say, but I think I did have an advantage when it came to soft skills. Like I would sit in these rooms with highly educated, really smart people, and I would often hear them say things. And straight away, I'm like, wow, that's incredibly inappropriate. How can they not 
see that and it's just because their brains are wired in a slightly different way and I think my strengths come from like understanding I guess a bit empathy like being able to understand where someone's coming from um you know see them for who they are and then help to try to shift their perception um and I think that's actually probably where like Bumble comes in and Sunroom comes in. Like I have since been drawn to brands that are all about changing perceptions and they're slightly controversial at times, but they're about taking people on a bit of a journey and helping society or like what I view as helping society at at the same society at the same time. Um, I don't know. I I think like what what has also helped with confidence is I think with all of my sport, I have just been really used to being in high pressure situations for a very long time. I was always very competitive um, when it came to sport. I've always enjoyed competing at a high level. So I don't tend to get shaken up by high pressure situations and probably enter them with a bit more of a calm approach. Um, And I think sport helps. It's like when you know you're going into something big, you know how to put your mind at ease and breathe and just take it one step at a time and be focused on what you want the outcome to be. Because a lot of people find those processes daunting, quite daunting, and only because they've never been through it. They'd be sitting back listening to this and watching you and, you know, from a distance or observing you on various mediums and saying, well, how the hell did you do it? So what happened? How did you get onto Bumble? So... I had a friend who had met Whitney Wolfher, the CEO and founder of Bumble. She's an Australian. This friend of mine was an Australian girl that I went to school with. Um, She met Whitney and Whitney was looking for an Australian woman to head up the market launch of Bumble in Australia. And she was just looking for for people who knew the, the culture and I guess had grown up in Sydney and understood the social scene and knew the right people. And this friend of mine introduced me to Whitney and said, you know, you need to look this woman up. She co-founded Tinder. She's starting her own app called Bumble. And um, if I were you, I would probably take this opportunity. Um, And I had never used a dating app. Tinder had a pretty bad reputation at the time in Australia. It was 2016 there had been that tinder balcony death which you might remember where a woman died on a date and there was a stigma associated with going on on dating apps at that time it was viewed as being a little bit desperate or last resort uh so i didn't i honestly didn't jump at the opportunity to to talk to whitney she actually kept following up with me and um, I so I ended up getting on a phone call and it was one of those moments where you can remember exactly where you were, exactly what you were looking at. And I just got goosebumps in my whole body and my gut was screaming at me, um, this is going to be huge, you have to do this. And I was really drawn to uh, the mission that Whitney was talking about, you know, women making the first move. She was also already speaking about doing like a, a friend finding portal, a business mentoring connection type platform. So it was feeling like it was going to be more than just a dating app uh, and, you know, potentially something that would kind of revolutionize the space. So I was 25. I had absolutely nothing to lose. I had already decided that I wasn't enjoying HR anymore and I didn't feel like it was the kind of thing I could do for the rest of my life. So I honestly just followed my intuition and I ended up quitting my job and starting at Bumble, which involved me. Uh, I, I started my own small company uh, because they weren't going to employ anyone full-time in Australia and I had to prove that Australia was a market worth investing in so the deal was if I could get Bumble to a million registrations they would consider creating an entity so I was super naive (laughs) and I think naivety is power sometimes I don't know if if I knew everything that was ahead of me I don't know if I would have said said yes, but I, I did and I, yeah, it was sink or swim. Like I just had to get going. Actually, I love that naivety piece because that's that's quite an important thing. I want to touch on that for a second. Often intelligent people um, or people who understand all the ramifications have this ability to do a full analysis like risks and <laughs> upsides, et cetera, and in doing so they sort of paralyze themselves into not making a decision or they project, I'm not sure, 
type outcome because as they project because it's fair to say that you know you, you can't build a model because there's too many um, variables and they sort of we all we tend to build models in our head uh, you know like business models or we do modeling in our own brain our brain naturally does modeling and uh, we and if you try to input all the variables um to make a proper model you will never get there which is what I call overthinking <laughs> yeah but then there's people who on the other on the flip side say you know what maybe consciously I, I can't build this model in my head um, I'm going to reject my natural instinct to build a model and I'm just going to do as you just said maybe naive but just jump in and have a crack I mean just have a go at this just see what happens and in your case you had nothing to lose but most of us got nothing to lose um, you know to be frank with you I mean if you you know I'm not saying right away from a job you might want to do something or not but is that sort of how you approach it? Was that a conscious decision? I'm just, I can't really work out the modeling in my head whether this will work or won't work. I'm just going to have a crack. Or did you just, or is that your natural instinct, like a sports person? I don't care. I'll go on this race and see how I go. It was definitely my, my gut and my intuition, I guess, which could be, I can't work out the model. The model. I definitely didn't overthink. Like, I'm, I'm pretty sure I quit my job within 24 hours of being offered the role. I just had this overwhelming feeling that it was going to be the right thing to do and that I should do it. And it was a a pretty great offer to be, I think it was the sixth or seventh hire globally at Bumble. So I did get to see it kind of almost from the, the ground up, but I probably made it sound a bit easier than it actually was. Like once I did quit my job and I, I was working out my one month notice period and it really started to hit me. Shit, you know, I've just committed to this. I've got to start uh, start my own business, which I've never done before, and I've actually got to prove to this woman that I can I can grow this thing and I can do what I've said I can do. And I've never run events before. I've never done PR. I've never even stepped into this world. Am I capable of doing this? And I remember my mum just giving me a a pep talk about, you know, rising to the challenge. And I feared it for a really short period of time. And then the thing with Bumble was everything just moved so fast that there was actually no time to fear anything because as soon as the next scary thing was there, there was another scary thing just around the corner and you just had to get used to roll rolling with the punches. It's actually all a bit of a blur because of that, because it just happened so quickly and often I can't even remember how we did certain things because I was just so deep in the trenches and that's something that I'm really trying to do now with Sunroom I'm trying to be more conscious and take a bit more time to stop and smell the roses and actually be present um and and pay more attention because I was really just caught up in like this hamster wheel at Bumble great hamster wheel (laughs) And sometimes it works uh, uh, because if you sit back and think, too, overthink it or too much thought goes into it, um, that becomes a blockage um, and, you know, like uh, you lose your flow, uh, your rhythm. And But equally, I agree with you every now and then, if, particularly if you're the proprietor, you've got to step back and have a look at what the hell's going on. And when you said earlier on um, when Whitney was looking for someone who knows the playbook, local playbook, you know, we're not, we said it right at the beginning, yeah, He's a girl, manly, went to school local. Manly's about as Aussie as you can get, so to speak, in terms of demographics to, to look at the whole of Australia. <laughs> in the surf club, doing nippers, blah, blah, blah. You sort of pretty much fit the bill, thanks to mum and dad or whoever it was, the three into nippers at probably whatever <laughs> young age it was. And, uh, I mean, it's amazing how these things are so serendipitous, how they work out. I mean, like it was like you were meant to do be this person Given what Whitney was looking for, and but what's interesting about it is you grabbed it with both hands and you didn't overthink the process, because mm. you know like a lot of people would have analysed it and they would have maybe spoke to thirty people. What did you get out of going into Bumble and uh, launching Australia, and what what skills and what insights did you get out of that? Well, it was the first place I'd ever worked that really had a a mission that I could truly identify with. You know, it was all about women making the first move and instilling that behavior in women on a dating app could then mean that they would take that into their everyday lives. And maybe they would ask for the promotion. They would ask for the pay rise. And um, I really believed in that, I guess, way, way of thinking. Um, So for me, it showed, it, it showed me how important it was to work on purpose led and mission driven brands um, and to absolutely love what I 
do every day. That was the first time that I'd ever worked somewhere where I, Mondays weren't Mondays anymore. I never dreaded going to work. I could give 200% because I was just obsessed with this thing and making it work. Uh, of course, I'd never worked in in tech before. So it was exposure to an entirely new industry. And I think that feeling of being able to work for a brand that when I started, no one had heard of it. And when I finished, everyone had heard of Bumble. And that was an incredible thing to be a part of. And it showed me that I really liked working on something that could touch or reach as many people as possible. And that's one of the things that I now love about tech. Um, but I think the the thing that it, that I gained exposure to that's helped me out the most now was I witnessed a product collide with a societal movement. So when Bumble came to be, uh, it was in the era of, you know, me too and believe women and be the CEO. And Whitney was really uh, pivotal in, in leading that from this kind of, I don't want to say girl boss because I think that term is used um, it doesn't have the same association these days, but that's kind of what, what was happening at the time. And to be able to work on a brand that could play a huge role in that Bumble almost became, you know, the center, one of, one of the centerpieces of companies, you know, really making an impact. Uh, and that was a really like magical thing to be a part of. And that's something that we've, um, carried into, to Sunroom now and where we kind of sit and what we stand for. Uh, just to to be able to play a part in something bigger than just the you know the app that you're working on and work for a purpose, as you said earlier. Yeah, and I guess that takes me straight into Sunroom. How did that come about? Yeah, so when I was at Bumble, I began to feel like my identity was really wrapped up in that brand, and at the end of the day, it wasn't mine. And that started to to play on my mind a little bit, just how much of myself was like ingrained in in Bumble and being the local spokesperson and, and things like that. Again, I started to get this gut feeling like something, it's crazy to say out loud, but I just felt like there was something even bigger than Bumble out there for me. And I really wanted to go out on a high. One of a quote I love is like, leave the party while you're still having fun. And Bumble just meant so much to me. And I could tell it was becoming a bit more corporate, you know, it was about to IPO. And I just thought I need to leave before it changes too much. And I no longer, no longer love it. Uh, and I also need to follow this gut feeling. So I ended up going and working at, a, at another startup um, called Keep It Cleaner. And I really wanted to get closer with engineers and be able to actually influence the product. That was something that I didn't get much exposure to at Bumble. I, it really was all about marketing. So I wanted to go to an app's headquarters, uh, yeah, get more exposure to the things I just mentioned. Um, and that became a bit of a, I guess, a stepping stone for me because I also really wanted to prove that I could grow another brand and that Bumble wasn't just right place, right time. I wanted to see if I could take my skill set somewhere else and make an impact. And once I did enough there, I started thinking about my own thing more seriously and exploring some ideas, chatting to my network. And at that exact moment, basically, an email landed in my inbox from Lucy Mort, who is my now co-founder. And she designed the Hinge interface. So Hinge is another big dating app and its interface was truly like innovative. It just completely changed the game for dating apps. And she was Australian living in the US. So I thought, wow, I definitely want to speak to the woman responsible for this design. And I also can't believe she's Australian. Like how have we not crossed paths? And she had an idea. Uh, she'd been researching the creator economy. She'd been looking at platforms like OnlyFans and Patreon and specifically looking at how much money women were making on those platforms. Uh, and she was she was so strategic in how she was going to build out her team. So because she was a product designer, she knew she specifically wanted a marketer who was ex-Bumble. Um, and that's how we got connected. I was not as across OnlyFans or Patreon as she was, but I was very curious and could see that there was a bit of a gap in the market for a content monetization tool that had a mission and that was brand led. Uh, 
So we just started jamming on this idea and I started doing research. We would meet every day and it just became clear that I was becoming obsessed with the idea. So I ended up um, leaving Keita Cleaner and co-founding Sunroom with Lucy. I'm finding uh, some commonalities between you and many other entrepreneurs. When you're talking about how you got obsessed about all the various tasks within businesses that you've taken on prior to this sunroom obsessed you. You have this, obs- not obsessive characteristic, but this um, obsession with something you believe in where you understand the purpose and you think you can make a difference. I just wonder if you could just explain to me how do you interact with obsession? Is that something you could that remains outside who you are and you can grab hold of it and employ it? Or is that something that's within your makeup all the time? Mm, yeah, I think it's within my makeup all the time. One thing I've learned about myself is I, like when I, I was talking about rowing, it consumed me as a teenager and then as a young adult. And I just threw absolutely everything I had into that. And then once I realized, you know, I probably wasn't going to go to the Olympics, I transferred that obsession characteristic, as you say, into banking. I was like, okay, I've got to get an internship at a top bank. Like I need to work for these big global companies. And then I transferred it into to Bumble. And I don't know, I guess it's the thing that I, I actually love feeling under pressure. I, I like thrive off that adrenaline and the need to run a million miles an hour at something. So if I'm I'm going to do that, I have to be obsessed with it and it has to, you know, really mean something to me and fuel me. But it's probably, it's something that takes a hold of me. I don't think I really have control over it. It works for you. It's sort of like one of the soft skills that you talked about before. It, it is a skill. It is a soft skill, uh, knowing how to deal with obsession and do everything full on. Mm. Yeah, I also, I, I think it just depends on the kind of person you are as well. Like career has just become so important to me. And if I'm going to give my all, and, and I like giving my all to to my job, like that's what I did at Bumble. That's what I did at Kick. That's what I did in banking. And it's, it's worked for me. It's kind of got me to where I am now. So if I'm, if I'm going to give it my all, I have to absolutely love it and live and breathe it and I'm also very aware of the fact that you know like I might not be able to to do this forever I might have other priorities that come up later in my life you know when I want to have kids or maybe like my things change for me so I feel like now is really the time for me to go 100 percent um and yeah I I, you're right like I do choose what I'm going to transfer that obsession into. I'm not obsessed about everything. I'm kind of only obsessed about one thing at any one time because I, I couldn't give my all to if there are other things, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. It is, and, and I, because I see it as something that good entrepreneurs access when they need it. Um, and, and then, and I do see it as a soft skill, the skill being how to access it, how to use it, how to make sure it only applies, as you say in your case, one thing at a time. What's also interesting is that when you lose your enthusiasm in something, it's hard to obsess about it. So, you know, like if all of a sudden I f- feel as though I don't, I'm, you know, I'm not enjoying something or it, the purpose of it isn't delivering anything to me, um, mm. I wonder whether if you're in that position, you lose your obsession. I mean, it's hard to apply obsession to those things. Yeah, I I think I've had moments where my enthusiasm or motivation has dipped and I identify that very quickly because I'm not as excited about something, I'm I'm not as motivated, I don't feel as energized by it. And in those moments, that's when I will normally try to like come up with a project or something that I know really fuels me and like get stuck into that and kind of re re-energize or reboost boot myself, I suppose. Are you uh, one of those people who always has to have a new creative project? Interesting question because currently my day-to-day is so, so repetitive and it's very different to, to what, I've, what I've normally done in my marketing roles. I currently am responsible for onboarding all of our creators to Sunroom. So I have between 10 to 14 meetings every single day with the same script getting getting people onto the app. And I know it's a super important part of the process and I have to do it. 
but it is, um, it's been numbing my brain a little bit because I'm not thinking as creatively about growth, which is what I really, really like to think about. So I had a bit of an epiphany on the weekend, which kind of reminded me of like why I'm in LA and what I enjoy doing. And now I've like carved out some like safe zones where I can focus on that just to yeah keep myself a bit more balanced and fueled and excited. Sunroom to those who aren't used to what Sunroom is, I mean. So Sunroom is an app for creators to monetize their content, specifically for women and non-binary creators. So it's almost like a cross between Patreon and OnlyFans and Instagram and TikTok. So creators come onto the app, they set their monthly subscription price and their followers kind of come onto Sunroom and pay to access them on a deeper level. So they produce premium content. You can chat to them in DMs. It's about kind of crafting a smaller community um, of your super fans that want to pay you for your time and efforts. Can you give me some examples of one or two creators, female creators, what they do? Like what is their content? Yeah, So we've attracted a lot of creators that are seriously censored and shadow banned on Instagram and TikTok. So we moderate content in a slightly different way to big mainstream social networks. So we have human moderators instead of algorithms. Um, And that means that when we look at content, we really take context into consideration. So on Instagram, a lot of sexologists, Um, can't really educate around sex um, because Instagram takes aim at their their content. So we've attracted a lot of sexologists speaking more about sexual education for women, pleasure, um, a lot of mummy bloggers as well. So a lot of mummy bloggers are also censored on Instagram because um, Instagram and TikTok don't really like conversations about childbirth um, and breastfeeding. So we've also seen that content category really gravitate towards Sunroom. Um, There's also a lot of business owners speaking about like brand building, fundraising um, and offering mentoring and career coaching from within the app. And then there's also more like reality TV public figures um, in the app who are just showing more of their day-to-day life, um, more behind the scenes stuff speaking more intimately about their personal life and the kind of things that they don't really want to broadcast um, to the mass public. But it's totally up to the creator. Yeah, so it's up to the creator. Then they build their own subscription base below that and you're effectively a marketplace uh, for between subscribers and the creators. Y- yeah. You've built the marketplace platform, yeah. And uh, um, I just, just, I was just when you were speaking, I was just thinking to myself, have you recruited, so to speak, or put on – to Sunroom, any women out of, or non-binary, but any women in particular out of, say, somewhere like Ukraine, which is at war at the moment, have they, is there a product coming out of that? No, we actually haven't got any Ukrainian creators yet, but two of our engineers are actually you know, Ukrainian. They've now moved to Poland. Um, but we we really have been focused on the Australian and US markets to start. Right. Um and we, we only launched six weeks ago. So we oh, wow. launched with, yeah, we're very, very fresh. So we launched with a group of 100 founding creators that we proactively recruited and got on the app before launch. Um, and so we've, we've launched with this closed community and we've really been trying to see like what features people are gravitating to, if there's a kind of content that is rising to the top. Um, making product iterations before we go much further or spend too much more money on marketing. In terms of the platform, which is engineered on some format, is your digital analytics um, giving you all this information? I know you said before you have ju- judgments are being done by people at, the, at this stage, not the way, not algorithmically based mm. like the big platforms do. But in terms of um, the analytics around what works, what's not working, or where the demand is, therefore try and find the supply that is the find the creator who can supply the demand. Is that the process, or you're looking um, building the supply and letting demand come to it? How are you working this? Yeah, our our first priority has been the creator because it's a it's a great business model in the sense that it's built to make prolific people money, and these creators have profiles and the only way for them to make money is to share that they're on Sunroom and promote to their audience that they're on Sunroom. So 
the creators definitely do serve as a great acquisition tool, but then it's really up to the product to work with the creator in retaining those members. So that's what we're looking at at the moment. Like, is there anything we can change in the product to help retention and to help creators make more money? Is there more education we can build into the product to help creators set their profile up? Like we're starting to learn what the top tips are for creators to make money. So how is saying I do these one-on-one onboarding calls? They're obviously very manual. They they can't really be scaled, but it's like, can we start to take some of the things that are coming up in those onboarding calls and like pull them into the product, begin to automate some of the things that we're doing? You're taking the learnings from what you've already done and parlaying that into those individual creators or, or maybe even... Um, Um, customising it for those individual creators to make them more efficient in terms of being profitable, so to speak, or earn more revenue or get more more people on board. Exactly. So I look at what our highest performing, what our highest earning creators are doing uh, and I also look at what our um, lowest earning creators are doing and a bit in the middle as well, quite manually at the moment. Um, but because we're small, you can kind of do that. Yeah. Um, and then I, I pass that on to the creators as I'm onboarding them. And then I will also low key, you know, stalk that creator and try to come up with some ideas for them around how they could um, articulate what their offering is in their bio or how they could begin to um, educate their Instagram following on Sunroom and then bring their audience with them. So I am really trying to, what we're trying to do is create super users um, and really like handhold these first users because they're the ones who are willing to give this a go first. So we really want to give them our time and arm them with the best tools to, to find success on Sunroom and stay on Sunroom. Given that you're curating creators who then have their own content, but you're creating curators who to some extent get um, sort of disqualified on places like Instagram or, you know, those environments due to a whole lot of reasons. But you, as you say, it's probably algorithmically based. But how do those people right now prior to going onto Sunroom, how do they actually talk to their audiences? A lot of them still use TikTok or Instagram, but they have to self-censor. So they've been censored so heavily by these platforms already that they're no longer sharing everything they want to share. And every time they post, they're walking this fine line of, am I going to lose access to, like I've spoken to creators who've lost the access to go live. So Instagram will often like remove certain parts of the app for these creators. So they'll lose access to putting links in their stories. They'll lose access to their DMs. They'll be suspended for a month and then they'll come back. But being shadow banned is is the main one. So that's when um, you're basically undiscoverable on these platforms and only the people who are already with you can find you. Um, But I think that creators are also really starting to um, recognize that they need to diversify the platforms that they're on. So they need to be on as many different networks as, as possible. I think even when Facebook went down for that, I think it was like a 24 hour period in the U S I think it was not so long in Australia, but I think that was a bit of a wake up call as well. Um, but a lot of the other, um, one of the other categories that we also support is, um, porn stars. So, Porn stars often can't really like live their lives on Instagram or TikTok because they almost have a black mark against their name because they are a porn star. Um, so they have been like hacking around these systems for quite a while. They use OnlyFans. They've got their own websites. Um, so they have come to Sunroom just as a space where they don't have to fear that like their next post could be the post that gets them um, deplatformed because Sex, like porn stars and sex workers have traditionally been discriminated for their work off platform. Moderation to me is a, a form of government because that's what governments do. Government's job to some extent is to create, let's call it social harmony through social control, you know, because if I can control the masses then I'm not going to have something weird happen except on the extremities. Um, and hopefully everybody sort of sits in most of the people, you know, the, most of the population sit in the middle. Therefore, I'll just moderate and I'll police and I'll govern. To some extent, uh, media has become that way. We have governments who we, we elect. <laughs> then we have governments in media. Um, are you a rebellion? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I think that 
society and like particularly Gen Z, they're just starting to care more about the kinds of people that like run the businesses that they support. And I think we're just seeing it so often now in, in mainstream media, um, people being treated unfairly on, on these platforms. And like, sure, there is definitely a place for moderation. Um, but I think when moderation is being done at scale and algorithms and AI kind of take the place, there are so many things that these platforms get wrong. And what we've seen in our research is that the odds are really stacked against women and non-binary creators when, when that is the case. So it's cool that we can come in and like provide this new platform where we have humans that moderate, moderate the, the app. And really like, we're just making space for the conversations and creators that actually shouldn't be penalized in the way that they are on on Instagram or TikTok, but it's because of the pure scale that that's often why they they are treated this way. Um, and I guess the benefit with Sunroom is because we're a monetization platform, we're like a business tool for creators. We're never going to have the same scale of an Instagram or a TikTok where they've got a billion people creating on their platform. Um, we're always going to have a smaller number of, of creators because it's the creators who have a master following and want to run a business on on Sunroom. So we have a little bit of an advantage there and that's why we can take this hands-on approach. Or is this just a case of you being the same person you were when, you know, you worked at Citibank or you decided to go into HR and sort of Miss Michelle Battersby thinking about fairness, you know, it's just sort of unfair that you get disqualified or censored by these big platforms just because you're slightly different or you want to do th- your content is going to come out in a different way. Yeah, you're good. You've really looped it <laughs> full circle. Um, yeah, I I think so. Like that's what drew me to Sunroom is before I made the decision to say yes, I began speaking to creators in my network and asking them, you know, have you come up against censorship or have you wanted to put a price on your content and like you felt like you might be judged for asking to be paid for your time and expertise. And just hearing people say yes to those questions was enough to, yeah, it's, it's clear that there's an opportunity there and that's not the way it should be. And as I mentioned, like I love changing people's perceptions and I've found myself working for businesses where, you know, there was a stigma associated with going on dating apps and there's been a stigma associated with asking to, to be paid. Like, society became very used to just consuming content for free for so long. And it's cool that like Patreon and OnlyFans really took the first step for normalizing being paid. And now we're, we're taking that further and definitely celebrating, you know, creators being able to put a price on their time and content, but we're also um, really trying to look at, at moderation as well. And that's why we're this ded- dedicated space for women and non-binary creators because they need it most. Now you've raised some money recently, so you, you did a raise um, and you've got some big names in the raise and you're selling the current concept, so to speak. Do you think there's going to be a day, a bit like with Citibank and other places, that you become so big that you actually have to start to moderate differently and, uh, you know, mm. you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's an interesting question and, like, that's one of the – I mean – one of the reasons why we have a we currently have a wait list on on the app. So to get on Sunroom and create, you have to join the wait list and then we bring people off the wait list. And Clever. That, that wasn't really a way to make like this cool exclusive club. It was actually so we could we could grow at like we could let the platform grow as our resources grow because this is a really important part of our mission and a promise to our creators. So we are pretty prepared to spend a lot of money on, you know, building out our moderation team and ensuring that we always have human eyes on, on what we're doing. But I also think there's a part to moderation that is just such an easy win, which large social networks don't really do. And it's just around communication. Like so often creators are censored or penalized and they're never told why. And that is the really frustrating part. And I don't think that is that hard to do. Um, and so that's why we also are kind of bringing this human element like back into to tech, which might be a strange thing, a thing to do, but I'm really hearing in my one-on-one onboarding calls, like these creators are so appreciative that they actually get to speak to a real human because 
they've had issues on other platforms and never, you know, got an answer or been able to contact anyone. And I think it's really important at the start to like do things that don't scale. And then you can, you can learn from that. Like I was saying, we're building some automation of like some of the things I've been doing into the product, but there are probably going to be areas where like, we're always going to need to, to remain hands on and yeah, we're pretty committed to our cause. So we'll make decisions around that. You're going to have this uh, constant adjustment process or rebalancing process between no censorship and con- and lots of content. But at some stage, you will have to have cens- censorship. But not, I wouldn't call it censorship, but moderation call it, um, with explanation. Your slogan is not going to be no censorship, just content. <laughs> it's never going to be your slogan. I should clarify, like we do, we do moderate. So like, yeah. because we're on the app store, we have to abide by Apple's content moderation guidelines. So like there are certain things that absolutely cannot happen on, on Sunroom. Like we can't allow pornography, for example, but we can allow more conversation around like sexual education and, and wellness and things like that. So we do have a team of human moderators that like check, check the app. We just don't, we, we moderate with humans. That's the, the key difference, not um, AI or algorithm. Yeah, as you can see, I'm quite intrigued by all this. But um, <laughs> is the idea to be a bit edgy though? I mean, is that one yeah. of the things that, yeah, you're a little bit on the edge but not on the edge, so to speak, you know, like I'm in control. Absolutely. Like, and this is how we're saying that at Bumble I saw a brand collide with this social movement and at Sunroom right now the social movement is Gen Z are so sex positive and self-expressive and so much more in tune with their sexuality and identity than, I mean, I'm a generation above and I feel like they are leaps and bounds beyond my own generation. And they're really wanting platforms where they can safely express themselves and like explore different topics. So we, that's why we have this more like sex positive um, approach and really wanted to make a space for, for this and appeal to a Gen Z audience and where we see society going. I mean, I always get excited about stuff that's edgy. I mean, I, I, I take the view unless it's a bit edgy, you shouldn't be doing it because, uh, <laughs> I mean, I remember many years ago, like this is going back a long time, 20 odd years ago when I had the wizard business and you know, I used to get advertising agencies who would come to me and they'd pitch me an ad. You know, we used to go out to all the big agencies, they'd all come with their pitch and they'd look at it. And I used to think to myself, unless I feel a bit nervous about this ad, I'm not going to do it um, because you've got to allocate a lot of dough to it. And, you know, like I'll just become like the big banks. Uh, everything gets sanitized a thousand times over until just the only way to make it work is just spend a lot of money on it and mm. just hope it sticks over time and just do a lot of money over a long period of time. And um, and I wasn't in that position. So I had to, I had to be edgy, but also I want to be edgy. Um, and I always felt as though I was bumping into um, moderation, so to speak, moderators. Um, in those days, it was in the form of the uh, advertising council, et cetera. And I got hauled up before the advertising council two or three times in relation to some of the ads we put up. Um, I got pulled up by some ra- current radio personalities who um, said that they were going to basically pull my pants down if um, I didn't withdraw ads from uh, TV, uh, from primetime television, because uh, they, they considered them to be inappropriate. Mm. So edginess sort of excites me. I, as I've got older, though, I've learned though that uh, we talked about government, or the various forms of government, I don't mean government you vote for, but the various forms of people who govern your life, like, you know, you have to comply with their platforms like Apple or whoever it ha- happens to be in yeah. Instagram in my case. Um, Aussies are really good at pushing boundaries and, uh, you know, we're celebrating Shane Warne's life at the moment. He's a good example, a great Aussie. That's what everybody thinks because he pushed boundaries and he was a larrikin. How much larrikin is there in you? Are you being the Aussie Larry? Are you this is this the same person who got selected because she is a great representative of the Australian demographic? Are you actually expressing the Australian demographic right now in terms of what you were doing, what you did at Bumble and now what you're doing hmm. here in Sunroom? Yeah, I don't I mean, I still know that there are people out there that like can't see the value that, that may not see yet see the value in this or understand like the why. So I don't know if like the masses are are there just yet, but like I'm pretty confident that they will get there. And I think to have a successful business, like the edginess, you have to do something that that is a bit controversial and that that pushes the boundaries. I don't know if like like a larrikin is the right 
way yeah. of framing it. But I think Lucy and I both like aren't afraid to, yeah, I guess it is like Larkin, like we're not, we're not afraid to, to push the boundaries. And like, we are really like living and breathing our, our brand at the moment. Like we're both creating on it. We're both trying to be more self-expressive. We're both trying to prove that like you can embrace all of yourself on, on this platform. We both have something to prove weirdly. And like both of us don't really know where that kind of comes from but we've had conversations around this. Um, and like the fact that we both left these huge dating apps and we're both so committed to the next thing that we do being the biggest thing that we do. Um, and yeah, if we can push the boundaries while we do that, then great. I actually think it's really Aussie entrepreneur. Um, but, but uh, and when I say Larry, and I'm talking about a generational thing, you, your generation wouldn't call that. And Gen Z definitely wouldn't call it that. They have a different word, but it's the same thing. And, you know, mm. I want to know, I want to explore this. I'm, I'm, I want to be free to have a look at these things. I want to live my life this way. These are your customers or your your creators' customers. Um, mm. I, th- I mean, I don't know what goes on in other countries. I have no idea, but I'm just talking about what goes on in this country. Are you uh, building your business for the future, future-proofing it for what the next generation of users might be thinking about? I mean, and, and, and if so, what are you seeing? Are they, are they bouncing away from Gen Z or are they – uh, I mean, coming back into where we were prior to that or are they going further out, wider? Wow. I haven't even had, like, I, I've i not even really thought about that, to be totally honest, like the next generation after Gen Z, but I probably should start to think about that. I would expect them to take things even further. Um, I, yeah, I, th- I think, gen like, t- targeting Gen Z at the moment has been, amazing and I think that they really are like leading a lot of huge societal change at the moment and if you are a mission and purpose-led brand like you need to be thinking about them I need to think more hard about the the gen what are they called gen alpha is that who's after I don't know what they are (laughs) I was hoping you would tell me but there is something beyond it I know because I mean I I see them (laughs) yeah they're alive yeah, um, I mean, but I, but I do experience them, like you know, uh, grandkids, grandsons, uh, godsons, like just people's kids, and yeah. they they are different to Gen Z. Do you know what I've I hang out with a group of people in LA, and they've all got uh, kids that are like young, that they're, they're teenagers. So I guess they would be in this next generation, which I think is Gen Alpha. And I will often chat to them about like, have you heard about OnlyFans? Like these fifteen and sixteen year olds, and they all have heard about OnlyFans and they're all so heavily influenced by TikTok. Like I'll watch them dance at like these little functions we go to and they're doing all of the TikTok moves and they're going to be so heavily influenced by the digital platforms that surround them. Um, but I, yeah, I to be totally honest, we haven't started thinking about building specifically for them. That's interesting because I guess, uh, I mean, that's probably – some of the things you'll be doing in the near future, you know, in terms of future proofing your business mm. because tastes or cultural societal changes occur. They just do look how fast things have occur- occurred with us in the last, just in the last three years. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, I, I, I'm at a stage in my life where I probably don't have to think about it, but um, you're at a stage in your life and, and your business and also the way you raise money and your investors mm. probably think about it. How do we make sure that we get future-proofed here because uh, this moves so rapidly? You know, we talk about Moore's Law, you know, technology changing or doubling its speed in every two years. I, I just think that uh, content changes at a f- much faster pace than Moore's Law ever proposed um, and, you know, the world's changing. I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit of a you know, well-used thing, but it's so rapid. The concepts are changing so rapidly, it's ridiculous. I look, I I think what you're doing is great. I love to see Aussies getting out there doing this sort of stuff, particularly if they can take it over, take it up to them up there in LA, uh, across there in LA, um, continue doing great stuff. Michelle Battersby from Sunroom. I, by the way, I might just slip into the app store and uh, download that app and have a look what's going on. You and, should. Uh, <laughs> I will. I'm going to. I'm. I'm. Yeah. I'm. I'm. I just it'll be the first thing I do as soon as I uh, hang up off this call. I, I'm serious. I will. Um, yeah. And uh, good me, luck with everything. Give me your yeah, feedback on. as well. If I will. anything doesn't I will. make sense, yeah, you got to let me know. If you've got any product ideas, send them my way. Okay. Well, <laughs> cool. I will do that. Thanks, Michelle. Appreciate it. Thank you.